Hello, everyone. Today on the final bar, we'll talk about a choppy market environment. Nice sell off this morning. Consumer staple stocks going to the moon like Kroger and others. GameStop continuing its uh, insane bounce to the upside. But overall, at the end of the day, it's about where the trends have changed, what's happened from one close to the next with all the noise uh, out of that. And that's where we see the S&P up a third of a percent, finishing near the highs of the day. I think that's the key message to take away. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we debrief on the action of the markets using the power of technical analysis, the power of charting and data visualization. Today was a fascinating day. If you look at the you know, intraday movements, the sell-off came you know, around 1030 uh, Eastern. I remember just watching things roll so quickly and very, you know, just very much seeming that there was no particular reason why things were, were uh, rotated so quickly. Um, and then a quick recovery, a bounce higher, and then, you know, just chipping away back to the upside. Utilities in the driver's seat today in terms of overall change in financials and energy uh, at the bottom. So, you know, again, it's like the, the you know, markets have plenty of noise. I feel like now more than ever, there are certainly many participants, a lot of activity that is causing stocks to move with cryptocurrency like uh, volatility, it feels like on, uh, on days like this. Uh, but overall, I would I would argue there is still uh, you know incredible value in taking a step back and looking at the trends, how they've changed. And I was doing a webinar earlier today, looking at a trend line using the S and P 500. As long as we remain above that trend line on a closing basis, the short term trend is up. And so far, we've remained above it. Now we have some great guests on this show coming through every week. And again, I'm I'm super thankful the conversations that I'm able to able to have. And uh, it's a pleasure to share some of those with you on the air. Coming up this week on Tuesday, we have Bruce Powers. I met Bruce years ago as a CMT, and I met him through the CMT Association. He, he, much of his career spent in Dubai, but also has focused a lot on cryptocurrencies in recent years. So I'm actually very interested to hear his take on the accelerated volatility on opportunities within the crypto space, Bitcoin versus others, and we'll see what he has to say. On Wednesday, we'll talk sectors and asset rotation with Julius DeKempener, of RRG Research and host of Sector Spotlight on Stock Charts TV. On Thursday, options expert Danielle Shea from Simpler Trading. She's been talking a lot recently about the FANG stocks, or what I tend to call the FAN mag stocks, certainly have emerged over the last uh, week or two after being relatively stagnant. And we're seeing some reversals after those breakouts on charts like Netflix and others. So what's next for that group? We'll see what uh, Danielle has to say. Let's continue on with our market recap. As I mentioned, S&P up just over a third of a percent. The NASDAQ pushing higher up 0.7% for the NASDAQ composite and the NASDAQ 100. Um, the NYSC, though, down a little bit. You can see mid caps were really the, the weakest of the three, down a third of a percent. Most other things in the green, varying le levels of green. Dow essentially finished flat uh, after being, uh, you know, really a lagging of those uh, of the three major indexes, uh, almost getting back to, uh, to flat. The VIX a little bit higher just above 23. Looking at non-equity asset classes, bonds really appreciated uh, through the course of the day, came up strong in the uh, out of the open, and then continued to push higher. The dollar essentially flat, uh, so chopping a little bit uh, around in the uh, in the form of the UUP. Finally, uh, the commodity markets, we had gold flat, silver a little weaker. So overall, gold, since rallying on uh, you know Friday morning, it's essentially gone nowhere. Plenty of chop around today. But you know again, what, what I love about charting is it, it helps you see through the noise. If you look at a five-minute chart of gold, it's going to feel absolutely crazy in terms of the movements. But if you look from yesterday's close to this close, we didn't go anywhere. So you know, closing prices are important because it gets rid of all of the noise from last close to this close. And it tells you purely what directional movement have we seen with that, uh, with that security, with that asset. And you can see that gold essentially was, uh, was flat. Cryptocurrencies are actually mixed today with Bitcoin uh, higher above 33,000 again, but that's coming off of about 34,700 uh, a little bit ago today. 
Uh, so again, obviously, certainly plenty of volatility. We looked at the hourly chart last week, and I'd encourage you to keep your time frames relatively short as you're looking at that asset class. This is the trend line I mentioned for the S&P 500. Uh, you know, when you're looking at the trends, again, I'm not a huge trend line user in terms of uh, using them as a trading system or using them to execute. I, I am a big fan of them to understand the dynamics behind uh, price movements. And you can see using trend lines when a trend is speeding up or slowing down, accelerating or lightening up in terms of its pace of improvement or, or, uh, or uh, deterioration. Uh, but especially in a market like this, when you have something that's going to new highs, like we're seeing with the S&P, when you have an acceleration out of a base like we did in November into December, uh, a trend line like this is a perfect example. You can see the trend line starting at the end of October lines up with the low from the first trading day of the year. That also lines up with about a week and a half ago, just before the holiday in the U.S. You can see that actually lined up with today's low. We actually traded below the trend line, but closed back above it. So you know, my general sense of something like this on a tactical time frame, until you break down through that trend line and close below it, get some sort of follow through to downside momentum, until that happens overall, the trend is positive. And the reason why that makes sense is if you think about Dow theory of, a, of, a, of an uptrend made up of higher highs and higher lows, the only way we stay above this trend line is if that pattern of higher highs and higher lows continues. When that ends, we're able to break down through the trend line that tells. So in, until that happens, there's no reason to think uh, anything other than uh, the market's in an uptrend, which is what we certainly have been seeing. As I mentioned with sectors, I was doing a webinar just a little earlier. There's a CMT uh, conference uh, this coming weekend for Latin America. It's all Latin American presenters and asked me to uh, speak a little bit. Uh, to introduce the the, the uh, conference and and uh, and do a, a presentation, and we talked about 2014, which is a, a you know the middle of a long secular bull market in U.S. stocks. So it was a strong year, it was an up year during a bullish secular market, and the number one sector in 2014 was utilities. And it's interesting today you have stocks uh, you know closing higher, you have a lot of things going up, but the number one sector is utes up two percent. So I've often told people, don't think about what should work. Think about what is working. Focus on the trends and focus on if utilities are working. And it was able to see when we get to our sector segment, uh, utilities certainly are working on a price basis, even on a relative basis, starting to pop up a little bit. You know, that's where you want to bet your bets on trends that are working and lean away from things that are not working. When you look at the sectors and you think about what may not be working, it's these late cyclicals, things like energy, financials, industrials, materials. These were unstoppable uh, going into the fall. If you think about materials and industrials, like John Deere and others, just accelerates the upside. FCX, Freeport, Macron, accelerating to the upside. You then have financials and energy gapping up out of extreme low levels, relatively weak levels, having a nice run. But now you're seeing relative weakness in financials, relative weakness in energy. So it's certainly indicating more of a rotation back into those uh, those fan mag stocks, the fang man stocks, whatever we will call them, uh, uh, pushing higher. We talked a lot on Friday about some of the um, breadth and sentiment readings. So I just want to finish up highlighting some of the um, you know industry groups on the move and other asset classes. I didn't want to point out you know China continuing to impress a series of gaps on here. And anytime you know I see the market run and then I see a gap, I'll hear people talk about an exhaustion gap and say that's probably the end of the move. And I, I will tell you, given the environment we've seen and given the acceleration to the upside, and uh, you know, I, I don't know if I believe in exhaustion gaps at the moment. That might be a horrible thing to say because that might be the end. That might be the top in China because it keeps going higher. But you know, these gaps higher are indicating you know extreme euphoria. But you know, the left side of a bubble uh, actually has a lot of upside, and that's what we're seeing with uh, with China. Uh, with a continued push to the upside, the FXI, the MCHI, the EWH, the KBA, these are all the different uh, China ETFs focusing on different parts of that all sort of continuing their uptrend. Just because they gapped higher after a run doesn't mean it's over. Um, there's plenty of uh, potential upside still to be had in there. Finally, a number of groups. We don't have time to go through all of these, but computer hardware is Apple's group. We're going to look at Apple a little later in our stock picking segment, um, uh, shifting stocks. Automobile is the number one uh, group, though, and that's uh, Tesla, the Ford, GM, all in that, uh, all in that group, up almost three percent today. That is our market recap for today. And again, the trend overall is positive. You're seeing that in a lot of different places. Uh, you know, we don't have a ton of time to talk about other asset classes before we get to sectors, but I will take a brief moment though and look at uh, the TLT. You know, I think it's worth noting um, some of the relationships we've seen. We may have seen a bottom in bond prices, a, a, uh, a decrease in yield going forward. And I'm telling, telling you that 
just using a Fibonacci analysis of the TLT. If you look at the TLT, you take the low from November, which was this base back here, sort of this uh, descending triangle pattern or, or consolidation pattern. We broke out, accelerated to the peak at the beginning of March since then, really has been in a downtrend overall, especially in the last six months. Lower highs, lower lows. Look at how it's hit these Fibonacci retracement levels just beautifully. And it's found support at each one. We're now at the final one around just below 150 on the TLT. You'd expect that to hold if we're going to go further. This is where something like the TLT should most likely uh, bottom out, it, unless you're going to re retrace 100% and we go back down to 132, which seems unlikely that rates will be able to go that much higher than what they've done so far. So you're seeing some weakness in financials and energy. You're seeing some potential turn higher in bond prices or rotation lower in yields. We may see a bit of a right sizing there, even if it just gets up to 160, that'll cool off a little bit of the financials run that we've seen so far. So an interesting chart to keep uh, aware, aware of, especially with the Fibonacci retracement in play. Our next segment is sector setups. We talked just briefly there about financials and energy. Look, let's look at what the charts are telling us. When we look at the relative rotation graph, and again, I'm excited to talk with uh, Julius DeKempner. This coming Wednesday, the 27th, he'll be coming on the show. We're going to try to get his take because, as you know, we use the relative rotation graphs pretty regularly uh, on the show. This is something that Julius designed years ago. Um, you know, on the long term, using the weekly data, you can see that energy and financials have certainly been the strongest on uh, the count that they are the furthest to the right. The next tier of leadership would be industrials and materials. What concerns me there is that they're both heading southwest. They're heading the direction of deterioration. Most things are in a position of relative weakness. It's interesting to see actually healthcare is one of the few that are actually heading northeast right now. Uh, healthcare, uh, this is a technology here. It's a little hard to see uh, the two of these here, but that's actually the uh, technology sector that's heading uh, northeast. It's sort of getting uh, uh, mixed up with communication services. That's this movement here, this is consumer discretionary. So those are the things that are starting to show some increase in trend and momentum. Compare that to something like financial starting to roll over, energy starting to roll over uh, as well. Looking at the daily rotation, let's get a little more granular into what's happened. So these have essentially gone vertical. Things are rotating in a clockwise direction, but you can see that energy rotating down. Financials, materials, especially probably the least attractive of all uh, because they're heading in a true southwest direction. What is emerging in a position of strength? Utilities heading northeast, real estate heading northeast, communication services, the XLC over here. So energy is still the strongest. It's not bad. It's still outperforming on account that the uh, it's furthest to the right on the on the x-axis. But the fact that it's heading straight down tells you the momentum is coming out of that. So it may have been uh, the move. We'll have to see. Uh, we'll have to see what comes next. Often, uh, and and this is what I would be looking for. Things like financials and materials. One of the most compelling signals I've ever seen from the RRG charts are when you rotate into the weakening quadrant, rotate back positive, and it, all of that happens to the right of the zero line, right? If it rotates over here, this is what technology did for a, a long time uh, before going into the uh, into the weak lagging quadrant there. That's a pretty constructive trend because it tells you it's outperforming and it's just the cycle is coming in and out. It's coming in and out of favor within a longer term stretch of outperformance. So there's some of the things I would be looking for on the relative rotation graph. Now, looking at the charts themselves, and we're going to look at some of the, uh, the Staples charts maybe uh, briefly in a bit, but charts like Kroger, Clorox, uh, these just went vertical recently, and it's similar to what you saw with GameStop, st stocks that from a fundamental basis, it's hard to argue the rally that you're seeing. It's certainly more of a supply and demand story, an emotional story, a fear and greed story, uh, whatever it is. It's certainly causing some of these stocks to rally. Overall, Staples have been relatively weak. And this is a this is a bounce within a period of weakness, sort of this bullish engulfing pattern that you see on the XLP. You know, again, all else being equal suggests a little bit of a short term bounce here. So we'll see if there's further strength. A break below the lows of today would invalidate that as a uh, as a bullish reversal signal. But it's worth noting that what we that's what we saw there. When you look at things like financials and energy and let's focus on the energy chart, this is a two year chart, which really shows how we've accelerated back into the June high and then have pulled back a little bit. So it's certainly facing some, um, some overhead resistance. Let's dial it back to about one year. Perfect. So here, you know, if you think of the chart of the S&P 500, I drew that trend line from the recent lows. The problem I have with financials and energies, if you draw that same exact trend line, we're actually starting to break down through it, right? So the XLE has now broken down through that trend line. It's just quite there, maybe. Um, if we look at the uh, XLF, my guess is, uh, it's in a uh, it's in a similar sort of pattern. Let's look at the XLF. Let's make it a one-year chart. 
Right. So the finan financial sector is probably one of the, the worst ones in terms of breaking down through trend line support. Here's that same trend line uh, that we drew with the S&P 500. You can see here, we've now broken down through that trend line support. Now, again, these, these sectors have had pretty good runs and we haven't broken down necessarily through a really key support. We broke down through this most recent swing high. So it's sort of a short term downturn. We really haven't broke through the meat of the of the trend yet. So I'd be looking at like 28 on the XLF and see if we're able to maintain that. If so, overall, this could be just a backing and filling before we resume the uptrend. The biggest concern, though, is the deterioration in relative strength. And I think that's what concerns me the most on some of these charts. If you want to outperform, you have to own stocks and sectors and groups that are outperforming the S&P. You can't say that about the financial sector right at the moment with a roll it down, rolling down through, uh, through uh, trend line support there on the, uh, on the relative strength. Let's look at back here. I did want to highlight the utility sector. This is a fascinating exercise looking at how resistance can become support. If you look at the XLU, look at the resistance it found in June, once again in August, then we broke out of that uh, uh, resistance area in October, retested it and broke higher in, uh, at the end of October. Since then, it's come right back in to that same range. So this purple shaded area certainly is a key price range. It's certain where the market has memory for the XLU. And holding above that, I think, would be pretty crucial. What's happened is it's not just held above it. We're now breaking to new swing highs. So we're now once again seeing higher highs, higher lows. And the run that you see today really clears the way to retest this previous high range with the 67, 69 range on, uh, on the XLU. And it's suggesting a rotation back from uh, price weakness to price, uh, to price uh, uh, strength. You can also see the relative strength again on the two-year charts. Not that impressive, but that would be the last thing I'll be looking for to see if this relative strength can really start to break out. You start to get start to get multi-month new highs in the relative strength. That would convince me that the utilities uh, sector might have staying power. At this point, I'm treating it as a uh, as a bounce and looking skeptically at uh, at further upside from here. Folks, that is our uh, our sector setups. We need to take a quick commercial break. Back with shifting stocks. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. I'm Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. So good to have you on the show uh, with me every weekday as we look at these charts together. And again, in a, in a time of uncertainty, I think the fact that you're watching the show, the fact that you're looking at charts using a system like Stock Charts to increase your market awareness, to increase your understanding of what's happening, you know, good on you and, and, and congratulations on taking those steps. My hope is with our time together, we can help you navigate these markets try to help uh, answer the questions that, uh, that you're running into. As a reminder, we are here to help you, particularly questions uh, on particular charts, tickers, uh, technical indicators, market history, market dynamics, whatever it is, uh, shoot us a question. The final bar at stockcharts.com is our email. On Twitter, we're at final bar SCTV. And on our YouTube channel, you can put a comment just right below the video that you're watching. We're gonna do another mailbag segment on Tuesday's show of this week, and we'd love to answer one of your questions during the show. Our next segment is called Shifting Stock. So we have a three-pronged approach to market analysis, which really is a, a 30-minute run through, uh, you know, highlighting some of the things that come up in my natural process of analyzing the markets uh, using charts. Starts with a macro discipline of looking at price, breadth, and sentiment. We really talk a lot about that on Friday show every week. Uh, then sectors are, are the second big component, just understanding rotations, looking at things like utilities emerging, things like the FANG stocks, tech, and consumer uh, discretionary outperforming versus the late cyclicals and, uh, and value-oriented sectors. The third and very important piece is bottom-up stock picking and looking at particular charts and trying to compare the themes that you see on the individual stock charts with the big picture themes we've seen in those first couple steps. And even if you just trade the E-mini, uh, the Dow E-minis, or even if you just trade you know, uh, uh, futures contracts or, or broad uh, ETFs, I would encourage you to look at individual stocks because more often than not, from my experience, Big reversals, big changes of character are often reflected on the individual stock charts before the chart of the S&P or the Russell really reflects uh, that things are changing. That's why breadth is so important to me. And that's why looking at individual stocks can be very, very important. Having said that, that's enough of a uh, strong intro. Let's get into the charts. I'm going to start with the fan mag charts. We've, we've looked at this in a, in a couple different uh, ways. This, this, this emergence, the reemergence really of the FANG stocks 
is a key theme, I think, for the beginning of 2021. I think will be with us for uh, for quite a while this year. Uh, the relative strength in the FANG Plus index breaking to a new 12-month uh, high in the last week. It's an impressive run after being relatively flat. And if you look at the price patterns on things like Facebook, essentially sideways, right? Sort of a consolidation pattern after the run up uh, from the uh, from the March lows. We're at an interesting point right now. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is Apple. Uh, I, we highlighted this uh, last week, sort of this cup and handle pattern with a uh, big rounded bottom, a shorter, shallower correction. As of this morning, we break, uh, you know, arguably closed above that on Friday, new closing high, but really uh, traded above it today. Is that the confirmation we are waiting for, suggesting much further upside? Overall, I think Apple's a fantastic uh, chart. I, I could see that, you know, improving materially from here. It's one of my, one of my, one of the better charts out there, I would say, especially this couple and handle pattern, but we have to get the follow through out of this base. What concerns me about it are chart, charts like Netflix, which a couple of days ago had that exact opportunity to get above this uh, this congestion zone, this uh, this resistance area, and follow through, and it did not. It's now back within this range, so it's now a failed breakout by my definition. Uh, looking at Netflix, Microsoft, right at the upper end of this range, trying to make a new closing high, not quite getting above the peak uh, from uh, from here from the beginning of September, but testing there. Amazon a little bit below it, not really getting above uh, previous swing highs. The strongest out of the, the six in my argument would be Alphabet, which is already broken above it, but it's doing a Netflix kind of thing where it's sort of stalling a little bit. So we have a couple charts, maybe Apple and, and Microsoft, which are threatening to break out, but not quite following through. You have charts like Alphabet and Netflix, which are arguably starting to fail uh, and not follow through on the breakouts. I don't know what that makes me think about going forward. You want to see these uh, charts continue to emerge to the upside and get follow through. And what I mean by that is higher closes in that direction, indications that buyers are not exhausted, but are taking this uh, to uh, to further high. So I think it's still wait and see mode on the fan, fan mag stocks. Although I think looking at something like Netflix, maybe which broke out and now has pulled back, maybe the most uh, instructive Apple would be number two. Let's look at some other charts. And this is going to be sort of rapid fire. I look at a lot of uh, charts over the weekend uh, into Monday morning, and I'm highlighting some of the ones that are key. You know, there are a number of charts, uh, especially in communication services, maybe consumer discretionary, I would say, which are pulling back to some pretty interesting levels. If you look at the chart of Comcast, I don't think this trend line is necessarily uh, in play here. This is the low, and then this is the other one. Yes, yeah, so we're still pretty far above a trend line taking those long term lows, but what we have done is pull back, uh, and this is a chart that's had a nice uh, breakout here above uh, uh, in September, above 47, broke above there finally in November. We're pulling above there. I think we're at that sort of, uh, we're in a rounding error away from that uh, previous swing high, that breakout level. That's where you'd expect to hold. It's also sort of the lower end of this, uh, or the upper end of this gap here. And I think whether or not that's able to hold, I think it'd be pretty key. It could be a viable pullback, especially given the fact that the RSI is full in bullish range, a pullback getting to an RSI of 40 is more indicative of a bullish phase and a bearish phase. So I think we're right at that point. If it can hold 48, I'd be pretty, uh, I'd be pretty optimistic about Comcast continuing to go uh, further. There are others in that space. There's uh, Lumen. Uh, if you don't know this one, this is, um, uh, you said, oh, I'm thinking Capital One, that's not it. Um, I forget the name of it. CenturyLink, sorry. It used to be CenturyLink Field in Seattle. Now it's Lumen Field, I wanna say. Um, the, the chart is actually pretty impressive. Uh, taking the uh, resistance from August, now breaking above it, potentially retesting it and rolling to uh, two new swing highs. That's sort of a viable pullback that appears to be appears to be working. Verizon as well is actually bouncing off its 200-day moving average. AT&T not really participating uh, as well. Uh, but you know, a chart like this, it's it's not a bad. I mean, I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't be afraid to look at a chart like this opportunistically, thinking about a return to previous uh, highs as a short-term uh, swing. That's actually a nice bounce off of the 200-day, like we saw. At the end of uh, at the end of October, maybe an interesting one. A lot of charts in consumer discretionary that we could look at. I'll try to hit on a couple of them. Some of them are you know really in good uptrends and and at or near new highs, similar to that Apple chart where it just feels constructive. If you look at the chart of Borg Warner, which is uh, in the auto parts group in consumer discretionary, you had this lower highs, lower lows pullback in September and October, a bit of a distribution. Then look how that changed to a period of accumulation, higher highs, higher lows. We've now bounced off the 50-day. I know making a, uh, a new 52-week closing high last week, threatening to get back uh, right above those levels uh, as well. There are other charts like that. Um, uh, one, I want to say um, uh, Robert Half. Yep, it's a, it's a nice one as well within consumer discretionary, breaking to new highs 
I'm looking at my list here. eBay is another one, not quite making to new highs, but I like the bounce and the rotation higher. So this similar in terms of uh, Borg Warner with the with the with the uh, downtrend of lower highs, lower lows now reversing, higher highs, higher lows, and I sort of like like that price action uh, continuing to the uh, to the upside. Uh, Newell's another one, NWL. Uh, with uh, this is actually a little more extended, but you have to like the run. It's funny, you know, I, I'm often asked with stocks like this, you know, what should you be looking at this, you know, because it's at new highs and, and be, people being afraid to buy the new highs list. And I, I can't tell you with certainty that this is going to go up to 35 next, but I will tell you, you could add the same argument back here in November or here in uh, mid-November or here in the beginning of January when it made all-time highs, made new 52-week highs, and it can continue to go here. I think what if there's anything I've learned from you know, the last couple of years in stocks is that uptrends can continue much longer than you think that they that they might or that they should. Now, those things look good. And again, I'm not even getting to technology, things like Skyworks and the in the semiconductor space kind of rotating really well. What's not working? What are the concerns uh, out there? You know, just a couple that came out that I would I would flag as a, you know, potential hold on uh, and, and see what happens and, and just make sure you have a good uh, plan in place for risk. Nike is one, again, could be early on, but it's been above its 50-day moving average since July and just closing below it today. Again, it's still early. I'd be, I'd be looking to see if it's able to hold that or not. Marriott, some of the luxury names like Marriott, travel names like uh, CCL, all breaking down through their 50-day, breaking down through recent swing lows. That's not an attractive move uh, after having a, a potential break to uh, to new highs in December, so I'm concerned about some of those charts and the uh, and the um, uh, resilience of those if they're breaking down through the 50-day, making lower highs, lower lows. So certainly, if you're in those sorts of names, I would think about where you'd be, uh, you know, taking profits, where you'd be, uh, you know, acknowledging the fact that the trend is no longer positive. We need to wrap the show. Uh, try to get through as many stocks as we can. We got to wrap the show. Three charts in three minutes. The three and three. Let's hit it. Chart number one is the TLT, the long bond ETF. You know, we've talked about, you know, higher rates. We've talked about the resilience of the financial sector. If you look at the KBE, the KRE, or even some of the larger banks, the regional banks, it's really just a, a chart of the 10-year yield and improving yields, increasing in yields, uh, downtrend in bond prices tends to do pretty, tends, tends to mean good things uh, for those stocks. And, and I'm potentially could make the argument that we've hit a bottom in bond prices, uh, again, given the, the bounce off of the 61.8% retracement level. Again, we break below 150, 149, we'll call it, on the TLT. I will be the first to tell you, nope, that's not it. We're going to see higher rates buckle up because rates can go much higher than you think they should. The, the rise in rates doesn't concern me. It's the fact that the bond prices have pulled back 61.8% of the way, which is a pretty meaningful pullback. And I could see a bit, at the very least, a bit of a mean reversion and appreciation in some of those uh, bond charts. Second is biotech. We didn't get to all the stocks that are starting to work, but it's interesting noting the uh, BTK, which is the biotech index, breaking to new highs. You know, different ones are weighted differently. So the IBB, XHB might, or not, not the XHB, I forget the, the ticker of the other uh, um, biotech uh, ETF, but you know those might look a little differently because of how the indexes are weighted, how the ETFs are weighted. But the BTK, the biotech index, breaking to new highs and finally getting above that July high, which I think is really compelling after bouncing off of the 38.2% retracement level so beautifully at the end of last year. Finally, a series of charts pulling back to the 200-day moving average. I've been looking at these, like Verizon bounced off of it, PG, Procter & Gamble uh, bouncing off its 200-day uh, visa, which I put down here, uh, you know, doing a, a nice sort of reversal candle right at its 200-day uh, moving average, I would be keeping an eye on some of those. Those able to, those being able to hold the 200-day would be pretty constructive overall. Those being unable to, and if they break down through that 200-day moving average, that's what makes the breadth indicator start to look a little weaker. That's what tells you that people are taking profits in those names and would, would uh, cause me to be concerned a little bit. It'd be interesting to see here, especially with Procter & Gamble coming out of its oversold region, which has not happened very often. It's been more of a bullish phase for uh, much of last year. So this could be a bit of a change of character. It's all about whether or not, it can hold a 200-day moving average. Folks, that is our show for today. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close. Get your questions in for our mailbag segment tomorrow. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.